four. Let me put that person in, sorry. Um, so Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through June for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at the pbd.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. Um, and if you are enjoying our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And we are able to bring you outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. Today, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Lindsay Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is an assistant professor in the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona. Her work draws on methods in ethnohistory and indigenous archaeology to investigate the material histories of indigenous communities in the Southwest, as well as how the, these communities negotiated and resisted Western colonialism. Her current research revolves around a multi-institutional collaborative pro research project with Picaris Pueblo in New Mexico. Montgomery is an author of A History of Mobility in New Mexico, um, for, uh, coming out this year, 2021, which investigates long-term landscape use by mobile communities in Northern New Mexico, and co-authored alongside uh, Chip Colwell of Objects of Survivorance, um, which is a University of Colorado Press, uh, 2019, which investigates the history of Indian education among several American Indian communities across the American West. Um, at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function, either at the bottom or at the side of your Zoom screen. And we will then give our speaker time to answer as many questions as they can with the understanding that they might not get to all of them. So welcome, Dr. Montgomery, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. It's always nice to be with another Lindsay, have another Lindsay in the room. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for the invitation to come and speak with you guys. And I'm broadcasting to you from the traditional homelands and unceded territories of the Tolono Atam and Pascoyaki peoples here in Arizona. I always like to acknowledge the land that I'm standing on, even when we're in a kind of virtual space. So today, what I'd like to do is talk about some of my work on Comanche people, particularly on this idea of Comanche imperialism, and to try to kind of interrogate and pick away at this idea of the West as having a kind of inevitable and direct line to conquest over indigenous groups like the Comanche and others in the American Southwest. So let's just dive right in. Okay, so as Americans, right, we have often taken for granted Western hegemony on the global stage. This, this idea has been interrogated in a number of kind of big picture histories, which seek to explain how the West won and the rest apparently lost. This particular kind of genre of historical literature aims to add data to one of our basic kind of taken for granted assumptions, mainly that the West is superior. A brief review of the New York Times bestseller list for the past 20 years reveals a kind of litany of well-researched books that document Western civilization's rise to power. In explaining and in some ways justifying the current place of Europe and the United States and the world today, these narratives portray the history of the West as a series of kind of intellectual and military triumphs while glossing over counter examples. Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, a, a book that's been picked on a lot by anthropologists, is one of these kind of big picture histories that has at its core a kind of assumption about the universality of Western superiority. So today's talk, we're gonna pick on it a little bit more, but from a different perspective. So Diamond's driving question for, I'm sure many of you have probably read this book, but just as a refresher, Diamond's kind of driving question derives from an encounter that he has with a Papua New Guinean man named Yali, 
who asks Diamond why white people have so much material wealth compared to black people. Now to answer Yali's question, Diamond turns to three things, which are in the title of his book, guns, germs, and steel. Th this is his explanation. And in developing this answer, Diamond actually only looks for evidence, historical evidence for Western success and not for moments of failure when non-Western civilizations successfully outnumbered, outmaneuvered, outperformed the West. So today's brief talk that I wanna give you guys today is about changing the question. So instead of Yali's question, instead of looking for explanations for why European people and groups rose to power, I'd like us to ask why and when did indigenous groups triumph over the West? Now, in order to answer this question, we need to look for alternative lines of evidence which reflect indigenous rather than European perspectives. So we need to turn away from the archives and start to look at the material record. So I want to do that by looking at a site and an area that's part of my dissertation work and is now part of my book, which comes out uh, the first week in April, shameless, shameless self-promotion, uh, if you want to uh, purchase it from Rootledge Press. But that book uh, comes out of my dissertation research, which focuses on the Northern Rio Grande and what material evidence we have for nomadic lifeways in this area of the Northern Southwest. Now for today, I really want to focus specifically on the Comanche during the 18th century in particular. And I want to subject the Comanche to the same criteria that Diamond uses to construct his narrative of Western success. And I basically want to see how do they fare? How do the Comanche fare if we look at things like rock art um, instead of the archives using Diamond's criteria? So uh, in undertaking this kind of daunting task of proving Jared Diamond uh, wrong, at least in one instance, uh, I'm gonna make the disclaimer just straight out the bat that um, you may very well leave today thinking Jared Diamond is right and I am totally wrong and that's okay, but let's give it a shot, all right? <laughs> so one of the most significant and largest concentrations of Comanche rock art to date is located within the Rio Grande Gorge at a site called Vista Verde, which is right along a well-known hiking trail called the Vista Verde Trail. So this site depicted in the map behind me is composed of a series of interlinking open basins containing about two dozen teepee rings. Surrounding these teepee rings are literally hundreds of rock art panels, which are changing the way that we think about Comanche history. So Diamond really offers four reasons for why Western states tend to triumph over hunter-gatherer societies like the Comanche. They have advantage in weaponry, they have a numerical advantage, they have centralized decision makers, and they have uh, what he calls patriotic fervor. So let's turn to this first one, advantages in weaponry. In New Mexico, guns were not widely available, and when they were available, the gunpowder necessary to fire them was often in short supply. So indeed, there's actually dozens of accounts if we turn to the Spanish archives in which officials actually lament the profound lack of military supplies that Spanish colonizers and settlers had in New Mexico during the 18th century. So in addition to being rare, the kind of flintlock muskets used during this time period were really cumbersome and they were often inaccurate, causing long kind of lag times between each firing round and having a firing range of only 160 meters. So even when Spanish soldiers had firearms, they weren't necessarily that effective. The lack of guns in New Mexico is actually mirrored in the rock art record in which we see a kind of widespread absence of gun imagery. 
the image behind me is actually one of only about three images out of hundreds. We literally have about 900 panels that reflect a Comanche uh, presence in the area. And there's only about three that actually depict any sorts of guns. And one example is this one behind me. So this is a, a kind of gun tally. You can see in the bottom corner here, three guns in the bottom that have been uh, scratched on top of archaic rock art. So that those kind of dotted red lines behind it are archaic pecked glyphs that Comanche people have come and drawn a gun tally on top of. So on the other side behind me is a, a picture of a typical 18th century um, Spanish escopeta musket that gives you a, a sense of a kind of comparison. So the drawings that the Comanche did were actually pretty accurate to, to what these um, muskets, Spanish muskets look like during this time period. So guns are pretty sparse in New Mexico period until about 1760 when guns become more widely available to Comanche traders through their connections in French uh, Louisiana and through French traders on the Northern Plains. So in combination with Spanish horses, French guns gave the Comanche a significant advantage over poorly armed Spanish troops. So what we see here then is it's actually not weaponry that gives Spanish settlers an advantage. It's actually Comanche people who are holding large amounts of French guns, particularly after 1760. The weaponry actually gives indigenous people an advantage over Spanish settlers. So guns played a kind of minor role in general in combat in New Mexico for quite some time. But steel, one of Jared Diamond's other key components here, actually did have a major impact on warfare in the region. So in many ways, steel swords gave the Spanish a significant initial advantage over indigenous people in the Southwest. They were less brittle than obsidian weapons and they had longer and sharp, and they were longer and sharper than clubs. So Spaniards could actually fight for hours and receive only flesh wounds while killing dozens of natives. And this strategy was effective for a while. Recognizing the power of Spanish steel, Comanches developed several strategies which ultimately gave them the upper hand in most 18th century conflicts. So during this time period, the Comanche, along with other indigenous groups, began to produce horse armor in response to the use of steel in combat. After the adoption of horses in the late 17th century, probably we, our best estimates are that most horses started to move onto the Southern Plains after the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. So in the late 17th century, we see horses moving into the hands of indigenous groups on the Southern Plains in larger numbers. So during this time period, after the adoption of horses in the late 17th century, but before guns become really widespread in 1760, many Plains groups like the Apache, the Ute, the Comanche employed an armored cavalry technique. Rock art imagery recorded by Mark Mitchell from the Arkansas River Basin indicates that at least two types of armor was used during this first half of the 18th century. So there's a collared type, which you can kind of see in this image behind me, where there's actually a kind of uh, leather collar that protected the horse's neck. And then there was a more kind of blanket technique, which you can see kind of up here that didn't have uh, that more protective collar style. So the use of leather armor equipped with the high accuracy bow and arrow gave indigenous equestrian groups like the Comanche a significant tactical advantage over mass infantry with the use of steel swords. So this is a panel from the Rio Grande Gorge that depicts the presence of horse armor in our area. So you can see in the image behind me, a pecked horse with that kind of uh, rectangular uh, style 
body indicating the presence of armor and then a kind of rider on top of him with a small circular shield. So those small circular shields are an adaptation to, to the adoption of horses into indigenous warfare. So instead of long body shields that pedestrian warriors would use, they would use these smaller circular shields. And just to give you a kind of contrast, you see the horse right next to him without body armor uh, with, the, with the rider actually carrying what looks like a, a spear. So in addition to producing leather armor, Comanches gained a significant military advantage over the Spanish using a distinctive style of guerrilla warfare. Unlike Spanish soldiers who wore heavy armor and were accustomed to kind of pitched battles, the Comanche employed an organized system of temporary but disciplined units and captains. Mobility was really at the heart of their strategy of attack. Comanche warriors would strike unexpectedly using seemingly kind of unorganized individual charges, which would distract and disable the enemy. These attacks were followed by rapid retreat, during which time the war party would actually disperse, break off into these small groups in order to hinder detection and capture. This rock art panel from the gorge actually provides some evidence for archiving of this military tactic of surprise encirclement. So we actually see in uh, US cavalry reports uh, where they are absolutely shocked to see uh, Comanche uh, indigenous people using this tactic of a surprise encirclement, which was considered kind of an advanced military technique that indigenous people would be too unorganized to possibly conceptualize. So this form of military engagement successfully thwarted attempts at, rep at reprisal while fueling the Comanche's ever-growing trade in captives and horses. So what you see, how we interpret this panel as actually being encirclement is with this horse and rider right behind me. So you can see the, there's a kind of top line of horse and riders, a bottom line of horse and riders. And then there's this horse and rider right here who's kind of turning. So they're trying to show in profile that there's a kind of movement, an encirclement movement going on. You can also see in this panel, the use of different military groups, right? So you have pedestrian warriors here with those kind of long spears. And then you have your uh, equestrian warriors up here, also covered in armor. So they have these big kind of circles around them that kind of hide the body and you just see the legs coming out. So they're also wearing horse armor in this image here, which is pretty cool. So in addition to guerrilla warfare, the Comanche systematically undermined Spanish colonial power through raiding. Periodic raiding was a direct means of acquiring goods, but it also was a form of impression management, which improved the terms of formalized exchange. So as part of a kind of strategy of intimidation, violence actually magnified Comanche power and encouraged the Spanish to negotiate favorable agreements. So in this panel behind me, you can see a kind of raid in progress. So in the top portion of the panel, you see again, horse and riders. You can see uh, with the riders that they actually have really long kind of headdresses to demonstrate status. Uh, and some of the riders are actually carrying what, what we might call eagle staffs. And you can also really get the sense of movement in, in the portrayal of this raid in progress. Now, in the bottom portion of the panel, you see these kind of shorthand, basically these shorthand kind of lines that were used to tally how many horses have been captured in the raid. Horses and captives obtained through raiding were funneled across the continent to other indigenous groups, such as the Wichita's, Iowa's, Kansas, and Pawnee, and were also peddled in New Mexico, 
to the very same people that they had stripped them of, which I find like deliciously ironic uh, that Comanche people were raiding New Mexico for horses and then selling them back to New Mexicans. Although Spanish authorities often um, mounted retaliatory kind of military campaigns against the Comanche in response to these raiding activities, these encounters were only temporarily effective and actually often cost the Spanish crown more in human lives and economic disruption than peace treaties. So raiding was an effective strategy for encouraging peace treaties because the Comanche had over the course of the 18th century really cornered the market on trade. So based on the evidence, it seems that there's a good case to be made here that the Comanche actually had a military advantage over the Spanish. The Comanche case demonstrates how indigenous groups were often able to transform the tools of the colonizer into actually weapons of the colonized. So I wanna turn next to this question of numerical advantage. So census data indicates that by 1750, the Comanche population was already larger than the number of Spanish settlers in New Mexico. I should really say Hispano settlers in New Mexico. New Mexico's demography began to shift during the late 18th century after the Western Comanche signed a formal peace treaty with the Spanish in 1786. The easing of Comanche raiding allowed Spanish settlers to undertake sheep and cattle ranching at a previously unfathomable level. So as the Spanish ranching industry expanded during the late 18th century, so did the Hispano population in the region. So we see a kind of direct link between Hispano economic uh, expansion, population expansion, and Hispano Comanche peace. So this peace treaty actually also correlates with the growth in, a, in the Comanche population, which gradually expands to be about 20,000 people by the turn of the century. So here would actually seem to be a good time to bring up the issue of germs, which is one of Diamond's other kind of key criteria. So according to Diamond, germs were a potent cocktail produced by human interactions with old world domesticates like cows and pigs and the rise of densely populated cities. So we see infectious disease linked to domestication and urbanization. It was through germs that European colonists were able to kind of fix or rig the numbers game in their favor letting their superior technology do the rest of the work on the remaining survivors. That's kind of how Diamond's narrative goes. The Comanche population was devastated by several waves of European germs. By 1870, the Comanche numbered a mere 8,000, right? From their peak population of 20,000, at least estimated 20,000, which by 1870 meant that they had gone back to their pre-horse, pre-equestrian levels of population. So if we follow Diamond's logic, it seems that there was nothing the Comanche could have done. They were betrayed by their own genetics, which lacked resistance to old world germs. But instead of this kind of fatalistic argument, I would like to present an alternative story, a story actually of strategic persistence. So Comanche persistence in the face of devastating European small, primarily smallpox epidemics was attributed to strategic mobility again. Comanche strategic mobility in the face of disease is really captured in their origin story. So this was a story that many ethnographers have recorded, but was actually told to me by Comanche tribal member, Catherine T. Jarina. So basically the story goes that the Comanche and Shoshone once lived together in two kind of combined camps. And that there was a kind of dispute that happened between those two camps 
that led to a rift forming between them. Around the same time that this kind of social rift was happening, smallpox entered the, the camp where the Comanche and Shoshone were living. And so in order to increase their ability to survive, the Comanche and Shoshone decided to break up their aggregated camp with the Shoshone going north and the Comanche going south. So according to Tijerina's story, the Comanche as a kind of separate ethnic cultural entity would not exist without germs. Mobility really allowed the Comanche to avoid one of the most devastating features of European disease, their rapid spread. Unlike densely populated sedentary villages where disease could spread quickly from one host to the next, the Comanche lived in dispersed bands. The effect of this social structure was that infectious disease actually remained relatively isolated in terms of its kind of negative impact. And so it was overall had a very small impact and a kind of isolated impact on individual bands as opposed to on the entire community. So it was strategic mobility, both in terms of the Comanche's initial response to the appearance of smallpox and strategic mobility in terms of the actual structure of Comanche society that allowed them to avoid some of these really devastating impacts that we see on village-based societies in the Missouri River, like the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara, who were really uh, devastated by smallpox epidemics. Okay, so the demographic data indicates that throughout the 18th century, the Spanish population in New Mexico remained relatively small until a formal peace treaty was established with the Comanche. In contrast, our best guess using Spanish records indicates that the Comanche population seems to have actually steadily grown over the course of the 18th century. So this suggests that despite the larger total population of the Spanish empire, in New Mexico, the demographics were in favor of indigenous folks, at least during the 18th century. So we also see here that strategic mobility allowed the Comanche to adapt and mitigate the spread of infectious disease. So they're not hapless victims of germs. They actually had strategic agency. Okay, so let's turn now to the issue of centralized decision makers. So Diamond's argument here is that having a centralized bureaucracy allowed Western states to more effectively distribute resources and execute military endeavors. The centralized political structure of the Western state, which relied on making agreements with individual leaders was actually ill-equipped to deal with the decentralized nature of Comanche society, which was made up of a series of bands called Numukanis. So Numukanis are clearly visible in the Rio Grande rock art. And you can see in this uh, panel behind me, this is kind of examples of the various ways that Comanche artists would depict encampments within the gorge. So you see a kind of clustering format of households. You see kind of linear alignments of households. And then you see a kind of typical U-shaped encampment which was often used for really large aggregations of bands. And within the rock art itself, you can also see household clusters distinguished from one another by adding different elements of design to teepees. So some will have scratched lines through, some will be open in the, on the inside of the triangle, some will be completely pecked in. So there's lots of variation in how these, the, these teepees were being depicted in order to represent different family groups. So this system, this kind of decentralized system of bands really allowed the Comanche to adapt more quickly to diplomatic and military realities and to diversify and expand their economic interests. Every band was doing something a little bit different and then redistributing resources throughout the entire community. So the centralized bureaucracy of the Spanish state actually significantly weakened their strategic position against the Comanche. Having a centralized military bureaucracy meant that anytime a Comanche raid occurred, 
News would have to travel usually great distances to Santa Fe, which is depicted behind me here, where Spanish generals would then go about assembling their troops and racing after the offenders, often to no avail. A kind of similar lethargy was encountered with regards to official policy, right? So with approval for official policy changes had to go all the way to Madrid to be, uh, to, to be altered. And so this created a kind of lag between the realities on the ground and the policies that were in place. So the argument that I'm gonna make here is that Spanish colonial officials and what they interpreted as a kind of lack of organization on the part of the Comanche was actually a strategic part of Comanche geopolitics. Because the Spanish were never effectively able to bridge the gap between their centralized state system and the decentralized Comanche empire, they failed to fully ever establish control over Comanche actors. All right, so our last, our last criteria here, this, uh, this question of religious fervor. So this is probably just between us, this is probably Diamond's weakest argument, but basically what he claims here is that states are capable of inducing in their citizens a brand of patriotic fervor, what he calls a suicidal drive that is impossible to foment within small dispersed bands of hunter gatherers. Well, it's certainly the case that Spanish colonization in the Americas was inspired by Christian religious fervor. It's not the case that small scale hunter gatherers like the Comanche lack a suicidal drive that was at the basis of kind of Western conquest. So although the Comanche don't follow a kind of formal religion like Christianity, they do have a clear ideology which imagines the world as full of power. Violence was a means of tapping into that power. So this wasn't violence for violence sake. Economically, Comanche violence allowed them to expand their territory and territory was used as pasture for horses, as buffer zones against enemies, as a source of slaves and livestock, and also as a source of commercial markets. So violence also provided an avenue towards social prestige, which is how we get the kind of documentation of military exploits that we see in the gorge. So one of them is this panel behind me. So what's really cool about this panel, so this is a kind of pre-horse panel where we have pedestrian warriors on one side with their kind of body shields. And then down below, you can see in this blowout here, they're fighting a Spanish conquistador or a Spanish soldier. So what's cool iconography, icon, iconographically about this Spanish soldier, right? Is that he has his hand on his hip and you can see he's wearing a kind of metal hat. So that's how we know that it's likely a European rather than an indigenous person. And this kind of hand on hip posture is like a classic kind of thing that you see in all sorts of paintings all over Europe uh, of, of kind of aristocracy royalty. And it's really intended to show like kind of righteous superiority. So what's, what's really interesting about the Comanche panel is that the Spaniard is really tiny and only a small part of the story. And it's clear from the way that the composition lays out that the Comanche are actually the victors. So you can see that big uh, pedestrian warrior on the right hand or left hand side of the panel here, uh, indicating that the Comanche were victorious and likely indicating the author, that the author of the panel had been particularly valiant in battle. And he's kind of portraying himself here in that image. So we have all sorts of kind of counting coup images in the gorge. Here's another one that shows uh, an act of touching, right? Of counting coup, as opposed to kind of military hand-to-hand -hand combat, like in that last panel there. So, in conclusion, uh, the argument I wanna put forward here is that power and violence for the Comanche function in a really similar way to Christian fervor for the Spanish. 
violence was both a tool of conquest and an ideology. It was the driving force behind Comanche expansion and instilled in Comanche men a profound desire to undertake and excel at military endeavors. This kind of suicidal fervor is perhaps best illustrated by the practice of staking in which a Comanche man would literally stake himself to the ground and would not retreat from battle until he either emerged, emerged from the battle victorious or died. If that's not patriotic fervor, I'm not sure exactly what it's. So at the beginning of the talk, right, I set out to answer this question, why and when did indigenous groups triumph over the West? In answering it, I have looked to the Comanche as an example of a kind of indigenous society that challenges standard interpretations of Western dominance. Through a combination of guerrilla warfare, numerical strength, economic control over resources, such as horses and guns, decentralization and military fervor, as well as strategic mobility, the Comanche were not only able to resist European domination, but actually were able to control a vast territory stretching from the Arkansas River Valley down to the Balcones Escarpment in Texas for over a hundred years. And you can kind of see behind me, this is a map from the Comanche Tipo of territory that's considered part of the Comanche's jurisdiction, which I think is real tangible evidence to the stretch of, of Comanche kind of imperialism. Thanks, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery, this is fascinating. So yeah, everyone, you can uh, type your uh, questions into the chat and I will relay them. Um, I do have to let you know, Dr. Montgomery, I have a, a colleague who's already like, I think I might require this video for one of my classes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So I've already been getting messages like that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I'm just going to begin while people uh, think of questions and, you know, work on typing it in. Um, what got you interested in this subject? I'm, I mean, I find it fascinating and I've always enjoyed it, but what sort of... <laughs> hooked you early on in your research? Um, yeah, so, so I think like a lot of scholars, I kind of fell into this topic uh, in some ways. I wasn't looking for uh, indigenous empire or counter narratives or anything like that. Uh, I went out into the Rio Grand Gorge uh, with my dissertation advisor, one of my dissertation advisors, Severin Fowles, in 2008, and that happened to be the year where we were doing large-scale landscape survey in the gorge and came started to stumble upon these images, these scratched images. And as you kind of saw in that first map that I showed of the site, the images, all this rock art is right next to this major trail, but because all of the, the rock art itself is so kind of lightly scratched, these are also lightly scratched. Nobody had recorded them before, which is really amazing. So we started to kind of find these teepees scratched on basalt boulders and all these kind of weird angles. And things started to emerge, like the significance of what we were finding really started to emerge. So, I mean, f stumbling upon being lucky enough to be on that project and stumbling upon this kind of unique archive was really, um, yeah. I, I couldn't have planned it any better. I couldn't have planned it. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so we have a question from Dr. Conkey. Uh, can you elaborate further on this intriguing concept of performance management? Um, uh, and are there other ways that this could be manifested? Could even some of the rock art itself be a way of performance management? Oh, definitely. I think that the idea so in terms of why we see this kind of aggrandizing rock art begin to be developed, uh, it, it's very much linked to the escalation in violence that we see being uh, both violence between indigenous groups and with colonizers starting in the 17th, 18th century. So I think impression management is key in terms of why the archive exists because 
men, primarily men, not exclusively, but primarily men would use the documentation of exploits in battle as evidence, uh, as evidence that would then be equated to social capital. So there was the kind of social capital that you acquired by surviving these sorts of military engagements. And then there was the actual material wealth that you acquired through these kind of raids. And how, at least it works in Comanche society, is that reciprocity is a core value. So when you were successful in a raid, you actually redistributed a, most of your what you acquired in your raid to the rest of the community. And so that was also a form of social capital. So there's a really a kind of direct link here between impression management in the form of documenting your military prowess and kind of social capital and also actual capital, right? In the, in the form of horses, slaves, uh, wives, these sorts of material goods. So I think it is, it's, linked to the creation of this particular archive, but it was also a kind of political strategy that allowed you to gain the upper hand uh, on a kind of, I guess I would say, a weakened, a weakened kind of European state. The Spanish state in New Mexico was not a strong state in the way it was in other places within the Spanish empire. We were really on the, on the fringes. <laughs> Thank you for that one. Um, we have another question. In terms of the rock art, um, how did you guys work on interpreting it? Um, you know, to know what it is. Like, did you work with Comanche elders, other academics? Yeah, yeah. Like, how how do you take some of these images that I think some of our viewers might be like, I see it once you say it, but I wouldn't have seen it beforehand. I hear what you're saying. You're, I mean, basically, it's like, how do you, how do you know I'm not making this up? And that's a totally legitimate question. So um, yes, we worked with Comanche, we worked with the Comanche Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, Jimmy Arterberry at the time, who came out uh, and has pro provided so much kind of cultural context for interpreting these images. And we also brought out a group of about 30 Comanche elders to look at all these panels and to provide their interpretations and kind of collective uh, understanding of what was going on. So we did work with, with Comanche tribal members to figure out some of the nuances. The other thing that we did was that this, what's called the biographic tradition actually exists elsewhere in the Southwest and West. And, um, you know, Mark Mitchell, um, Jim Kaiser, uh, Larry Lowendorf have recorded images similar to this in Colorado, uh, uh, in Texas, in Oklahoma, and in Wyoming. And so we looked to their work to find parallels in what we were seeing in the gorge, because this type of imagery hadn't been documented before in the Rio Grande Gorge, but had been found in places further to the north um, Alberta, Wyoming, all, all those kind of Northern Plains areas. Excellent. Um, another question about the rock art, because it's really fascinating. Um, you guys have found a lot in this one little area, but has there been other Comanche rock arts found in other, like to the degree that you guys were finding it in this area, it seemed like a high concentration. Was it being found in um, other areas? Yeah, so, so far with the Rio Grande Gorge project, which basically did survey in the gorge from 2008 to 2016, we've covered an area, it's kind of, I wish I had a map of New Mexico, um, from basically the area that's called Dixon, which is about, um, you know, probably 30 miles south of Taos all the way up to an area called Red River, um, which is basically 20 miles south of the Colorado border. So we've covered a pretty large area in the gorge, not continuously, but kind of strategic pockets throughout that whole area. 
And what we see is that most of the Comanche rock art actually tends to cluster in this kind of, not just at Vista Verde, but tends to cluster more towards this kind of a southern corridor of the gorge at strategic crossing places. And that as we move north in the gorge, we actually start to see much different types of rock art likely associated with uh, other Numic speaking groups who are ancestral to the Ute peoples. So we actually see that it is kind of geographically confined to this kind of swath of the gorge, but not just in that one basin. It's scattered throughout. Um, uh, another question is uh, about like sort of the Comanche Empire and like why why are we why do we not hear enough about it being an empire in sort of you know more like a Western way that we would think about because we think about most native groups as these like little pockets of hunter gatherers and things like that but really the Comanches were this huge empire and so why why isn't this being sort of talked about more in a great way? So I won't take credit for the, the coming up with the idea that the Comanche were an empire. Pekka Hemalainen, a Western historian, in his book, Comanche Empire, <laughs> was the first person to really kind of demonstrate through archival records that the Comanche were kind of in control of a political and economic, politically and economically over a large swath of area. I think the reason why we don't hear about the Comanche as an empire or indigenous people as having empires, um, at least particular indigenous people as having empires, is because it doesn't necessarily look like what a European empire does. So with the Comanche, right, it's decentralized. There's no single state directive like in ancient Rome that's kind of running the colonies and having all tribute centralized through uh, through Rome, right? That doesn't that doesn't exist in the Comanche case, uh, and in this indigenous form of empire. Instead, what you see is a kind of decentralized system where you have the Western and Eastern kind of groups of Comanche controlling political, politically, and economically exchange within these kind of broader areas. So it's a kind of empire that has at its core a uh, single ethnic group, the Comanche, but it's not a centralized kind of tribute based type of, of empire. It's an economic type of empire, but it definitely was acquired through military conquest, which is something that we also see in kind of European style. Um, empires. I think we don't, people don't talk about it, one, because they don't know, and two, because the idea, we've just assumed for so long that Indigenous people didn't, weren't capable of these kind of large-scale um, strategic actions, which is just, it's just a false assumption. <laughs> Well, thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank you to our viewers for these great questions. Um, and for our viewers, uh, join us um, next for our next episode, which is Wednesday, March 24th, when we are going to be joined by Dan Zoto, who will be speaking about small stem projectiles. And uh, again, we rely on support of viewers like you. So consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So thank you, Dr. Montgomery, again, for joining us all the way from, you know, Arizona. <laughs> different time zone. We always love it. Um, and everything and everyone else have a great day. So thank you. Thanks, everyone.